having me today, guys, and thanks for coming. My name is Karina. I'm the manager of The Big Idea for The Big Issue. And this is Ben, and he'll be talking to you in a little while later. Um, obviously, today we'll be talking about The Big Idea. We'll talk a little bit about who we work with. Um, we'll define a social enterprise and a social business. And the benefits of students participating today um, as well. Does anyone know, everyone knows of our magazine? Got some, no some nods, yes, yeah, awesome. You've seen it around, well, I'm gonna throw it around. You've seen it around the city? Yes, yep. Anyone bought one before? Awesome, we've got a few buyers, yeah. You, so you've seen it in the city, where haven't you seen our magazine? In shops, yeah, so we don't sell in shops. We only sell our magazine on the street and our magazine is sold by people who may be experiencing homelessness or they may be marginalised in some way. So you might notice on the streets that a lot of our different our vendors have varying abilities. So some of our vendors are in wheelchairs, we have vendors that are blind, we have vendors that are mute. You don't actually need to be able to walk to sell a magazine, do you? <laughs> no. So you can do um, that job um, with varying abilities. So a little bit about how we work. As I said before, we work with people who may be experiencing homelessness or marginalised in some form. Our vendors buy the mag magazine from us for $4.50 and they sell it on the street for 9 So every time they make a transaction, they get to keep that $4.50. Now, that's not rocket science, is it? Really, really simple concept. And that's what I want you to keep in the back of your mind. We don't do something that's you know, very, really complex. It's a really, really simple concept that has a lot of flow-on effects. One thing that we do focus on on the big issue is that we have a good quality product for people to buy. So we know that some people may buy our product because of the circumstances that our vendors are in, but they won't keep buying our product if it wasn't a good read. So we make sure that our product, every fortnight when it's released, is something that people will want to read. So that's something I want you to keep in, in your mind when you're thinking about creating your own social enterprise or social business. People aren't going to just buy something because of the cause. They may do it once, but they're not going to continue doing it if it's not a quality product. So that's one thing that we focus on every fortnight. So we sell around 27,000 magazines, ma magazines na nationwide um, each fortnight. We wouldn't be able to do that if it was terrible, <laughs> yeah? Um, so we employ people that have, are experienced in the magazine industry and print media and professionals in that industry. We employ people for marketing that are professionals in marketing. We have a professional accounting team. We need experienced professionals to create a quality product that will continue to survive. I want you to think about that because it's really, really important that you have, you think of a quality product or service that can, people will continue to use. All right. Um, so we are known very um, much for our um, magazine. We also have what's called the Women's Subscription Enterprise. So we did a bit of a survey about the vendors of our magazine. We found that 89% of our vendors are male, yet 42% of the homeless population in Australia are female. So we looked at those numbers and they don't actually add up, does it? So we talked to women in this situation. We said, well, why aren't you selling the magazine? And we got two responses. Can anyone think of what those responses were? Why women weren't selling? Ladies, I want to think you to think about this. Standing on a street corner alone with cash. How do you feel? I got some nods at the back there. How would you feel standing on the street corner alone? In danger, yeah. There was another reason why women weren't selling the magazine. Why do you think? What's the one thing that usually defaults to a woman in a household? Motherhood. Exactly. You can't really go and take a five-year-old child out into the street corner, can you? So we worked out we weren't um, servicing a sector of the community that we should. So we created what's called the Women's Subscription Enterprise. We run this in major cities across Australia 
and our women are paid at an hourly rate to sit and pack the magazine for subscribers. So for every 100 subscriptions sorry, that we do have, that employs one woman to sit and pack the magazine in a women's only space. Now we do it in a women's only space because unfortunately the number one cause of homelessness in Australia is domestic violence. So a lot of the women that we do work with, they um, may not want to be around men. We do it in an enclosed space as well, away from the public, because maybe they don't want to, people to know where they, where they are, their physical location as well. So something when you're standing on the street corner, if people see you and are passing by, maybe if they're in a situation where they don't want people to know where they're currently located. We also do this between the hours of 10 and 2. Why do you think 10 and 2? School drop-off, exactly. So they can drop their kids off at school, they can come and work with us, and then they can go and be there for the pick-up as well. So we accommodate for their needs, not ours. So that's another thing that you have to think about. We have to service the people that are working for us. That's the number one thing that we have to think of. So we not only have the subscriptions enterprise through this service, we also run a lot of social procurement, so um, we work with large organisations. Does anyone have a younger brother or sister that writes a letter to Santa at all? Some of you may have done it when you were younger. We receive all of those letters from Australia Post. And Australia Post employs our women through us to sit and um, put all of the names and addresses into a database. So we work with a lot of larger organisations now um, to do things like that rote work that doesn't require um, any, any background knowledge. So things like we pack for, we pack show bags for conferences, we pack subscriptions for things like Melbourne Zoo. Um, things that are really easy to do um, and that any, any person can do without any prior experience. So that's another thing that we do. We also run what's called the Big Issue Classroom. So we run this in Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra and online. These are one hour workshops for primary and high school students and we teach primary and high school students about homelessness, marginalisation and we employ someone who has experienced homelessness to tell their personal, sto personal story about um, being homeless. Uh, we find that that really resonates with, of course, teenagers. Um, you can speak to a teenager about facts till you're blue in the face, I think, <laughs> um, but until they actually hear someone's personal story, it really resonates with them. Um, so we have a great effect with that. So that's a, um, again, it's a business model. So our, the schools need to pay for that service. So it's a one hour workshop and schools pay for that one hour um, workshop service. So that's another thing that we do at The Big Issue. All right, so as I said before, we work with people that uh, come from all works of, walks of life. They may be experiencing homelessness or they may have experienced homelessness. They may have uh, experienced family breakdowns. They may have intellectual or physical disabilities. Some may, may be struggling with addiction. But everyone involved at the big issue and their social enterprises have been marginalised through their circumstances and are looking to improve their lives. All right. So we know that there's a lot of different problems out there without clear solutions. But we believe that social enterprise is one way to address those problems. So things like, of course, what's close to our heart, homelessness. Maybe things like uh, domestic violence, drug and alcohol abuse, climate change, indigenous disadvantage, disability, um, recent, those who have been recently released from prison, disengaged youth, um, suicide and mental illness as well. Okay, so what is the big idea? The Big E idea is a nationwide challenge inviting undergraduate and postgraduate students to develop a concept and business plan that might become the next big issue. Students are given the opportunity to learn about social enterprise in Australia while applying their skills and knowledge and develop solutions to real world social and business is issues. We'll help you develop your business plan by sharing experience, our experience of running a social enterprise. So we're Australia's leading social enterprise. We've been in Australia now for 23 years, so we feel like we are quite experts in the field. Um, 
We also have a webinar series of influential thought leaders in the industry as well as corporate as well. Um, as well as um, insights from people who have experienced homelessness. Okay, so as far as the competition question itself, um, is to develop a, co a concept and business plan for one of the following. Either A, a new social enterprise or social business, or B, a new social enterprise or business for an existing not-for-profit profit organization of your choice. Okay, which leads us to the next part. What is uh, a social enterprise? So for the basis of the competition, we stick to this definition. There are different definitions out there, but just for the basis of the competition, we do um, stick to this one just because um, we just need a, a, um, one source of truth, I suppose, <laughs> uh, we could call it. Okay, so let's go and talk about what a commercial enterprise is. So a, com a commercial enterprise directs its resources and creates products and services that ge generate commercial out incomes. So, for example, you've got supermarkets, general shops, um, any other traditional business. Social enterprises and social business operate using business principles and have social outcomes. There are a number of factors that differentiate social enterprises and social businesses from commercial enterprises and traditional not-for-profit organisations. Social enterprises and social businesses must be not-for-profit. So the definition of a not-for-profit organisation includes that they are not able to redistribute profits to private shareholders or beneficiaries. Any income or surplus must be reinvested back into the organisation's activities and functions. So although a commercial enterprise can deliver social outcomes, the social outcomes are a byproduct of their activities. So you think of something like uh, your local um, fruit and veg shop, your green grocer, they sell you vegetables and you may eat those vegetables and be healthy. But their main, they, their main motivation is to make money and generate an income for themselves. For a social enterprise and a social business, the social outcomes are an integral component of the organisation's design. So like a commercial enterprise, for a social enterprise or a social business to be financially sustainable in the marketplace, it must trade enough goods or services that it does not require any government or, on, or philanthropic funding. The requirement for a social business to create work opportunities for disadvantaged pe people is particularly important to the big issue. And the point in which we, inter we differentiate between a social enterprise and a social business. Uh, we believe that the most Im immediate impacts and sorry, social impacts occur when a disadvantaged person can access work and are able to earn an income. Okay, so how the big idea works. So it is through the second semester, you guys are semesters here. Yes, awesome. Um, through a series of online webinars and weekly discussions. So we do have universities that participate all over Australia. This year we have 11 universities on board. So we've got as far as um, Murdoch and Curtin over in Perth. We've got CQ Uni, a lot of their students are very remote. Um, in New South Wales we have University of New South Wales, Macquarie University. In Victoria we have RMIT, University of Melbourne and Monash as well. So um, all of, all around the country. Uh, so at the end of the semester, students will be able to submit their business plan. There is no word limit that we have or pres prescribed format. Students are encouraged to be creative with this. We do offer templates for, um, as part of our materials, um, as well as things like templates for budgets, um, all that sort of thing as well, and our webinar series goes through all the sections of your um, of your business plan as well. So finalists, you'll, we will have an internal judging round here at QUT if you have multiple uh, entries, where you'll have be able to pitch your idea. Um, have we decided who's going to? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> awesome. So there'll be an internal judging panel and there also may be someone from our senior management from the big, the big issue as well. And the finalist, that, that team will then be sent on to the semi, to the, sorry, the semi finals round. Now that's all held via webinar, again, for equity reasons. So um, it is, um, obviously we've got university students from all over Australia, some in remote areas as well. So that's all done via webinar. If you're then selected to go on to the finalist stage, that is held in Melbourne. So um, our finalist stage as well, where you get to pitch your idea, is held at PricewaterhouseCooper, who are our sponsors for the event as well. Okay, so the benefit for students, obviously you have access to social enterprise experts and high profile business innovators with a webinar series, and I'll go through some of those people as well. The webinar series and other resources, which are designed to help benefit students um, in developing their business plan, as well as the judging panel and feedback to hone your ideas. Okay, so just a little bit about some of the judges that we do have and some of the thought leaders for this year. Um, the first one I'm really excited about is Nick Pierce, who's CEO and co-founder of Homey. Has anyone heard of them before? They're based in Melbourne. Um, work with homeless youth. Jackie McKenzie is the director of the NOUS Group, a consultancy firm. Alex Opie is director of Impact Investing Social Ventures Australia. Uh, Hannah Miller, who's capacity building program manager of CIFA, so that's Social Enterprise Finance Australia. Um, sorry, not Zoe this year, sorry. Festina Delaney, who's the innovation consultant of Inv Inventium and Patrick Lyons, who's a partner of social re research at Synergistic. We also have the big issue management team. So Sally Hines, who's the chief, chief operating officer of the big issue and Homes for Homes. I'll tell you a little bit about that later, Homes for Homes. Amy Hetherington, who's the editor of the big issue. Jeremy Urquhart, who's national operations manager of the big issue. Emma O'Halloran, National Marketing and Partnerships Manager of The Big Issue and Homes for Homes. John Whitehead, who's the Chief Financial Officer of both The Big Issue and Homes for Homes. And Dania Sterling, Manager of Education Enterprises. Uh, as well, some of our judges that you may recognise. Cheryl Kerno, who's Social Business Fellow of the Centre so for Social Impact. Suzanne Curry, Head of Cro Property Group, Westpac Banking Corporation. Tracy Kenner, partner of PwC, Andrew Pe Andrea Pierman, general manager, community brand and reputation, corporate affairs and people of Australia Post, Stephen Person, who is C CEO of The Big Issue, Alastair McGibbon, who is CEO of Social Enterprise Finance Australia, Sally Hines again, COO of The Big Issue and Homes for Homes, Claire Ilbach, who is principal commodity al analyst, Strategy and Marketing Intelligence of BHB Billiton, and Connie Sakaris, General Manager Resources, Infrastructure and Government, Corporate and Institutional Banking of National Australia Bank. So these are people that literally take me a year to get in one to one room. Um, it's really, really hard to get the, that, the time from these people. Um, and the feedback that you can get from and exposure that you can get in this instance is really, really valuable. Something that you wouldn't normally get um, sitting at home going through your idea. All right. One of the, some of the benefits for students, obviously you'll be able to develop empathy and understanding of social enterprise in its context. Apply your skills and knowledge to real world business is issues in an environment subject to resource constraints. Um, something that we deal with a lot, working in the not-for-profit sector. Um, obviously, as well, you'll be able to learn things like business planning, project planning skills, teamwork, communication, and decision-making as well. Um, one thing that I like to um, highlight for students, it's a really good thing to pop on your resume. You'll understand in a few years' time when you graduate how hard it is to be memorable in an interview. Um, I've sat and interviewed uh, a lot of people before and I'll tell you what, students always have the same answer. 
when I talk about things, <laughs> when I ask to give you a real world example. It's usually things like a group project. Um, and <laughs> it's something that students, yeah, that um, think, think is good to, to um, mention in an interview, but it's really not because that's the same answer that everyone's giving. Um, you need something to stick out, something to get into their mind. Um, this is a really great way to talk about an experience where you've had some hands-on um, hands experience, not only, just develop, not only just developing your business plan, but working with others, pitching to industry professionals as well. Um, if you are looking to go into the corporate sector, so things like um, PricewaterhouseCooper are our sponsors, part of their grad recruitment process is to pitch an idea. Um, so if you have that experience, for, um, through something like the big idea, you've already got um, something under your belt. So it's not going to be as nervous the first time you go and do it um, as part of grad recruitment process as well. Um, obviously, we do have a little bit of perks for students. Um, we do have, for win winning teams, an Apple iPad that you get to take home. Um, we also fly all of our winners down to Melbourne for a professional immersion day with us. So not only experiencing all parts of the big issue um, hands-on as a social enterprise, but we also take you um, around to some of our partners, such as Cause Chambers Westgarth, who um, are our legal um, advisory group as well, uh, um, as well as an, a professional immersion day with um, PwC that's held in Melbourne. Um, for finalist winners as well, you are fast-tracked to the final stage of their grad recruitment process. So anyone wanting to go um, and work in a place like PricewaterhouseCooper, it's a really, really good opportunity because every year they get thousands of applicants. Yep. They're a consultancy firm. Yeah. Yeah, they're quite, they're international. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, like accountancy, mergers and acquisitions, all that sort of stuff. Um, all right. Um, obviously, there are outcomes for us. Uh, we want students to have a better appreciation of how social enterprise fits into the landscape and addresses social, in, uh, social issues um, and more ambassadors out there. Um, we'd like to promote social enterprise and the not-for-profit sector as, a, um, as an avenue for your career as well. Um, you will be obviously going out into the workforce very soon. Um, it is really, really rewarding to work somewhere where you actually know where you're doing a different, doing, ma doing and making a difference. Um, I've worked in all different industries, and um, this has been one of the most rewarding positions I've ever had. Um, and you may end up through the through the big idea. Um, as well, starting up your, your own social enterprise. So we've had students that have participated, that have gone through the process and continued on with their idea and are still um, out there in the marketplace at, um, at the moment, which is awesome. Um, so as far as timelines go, our competition officially starts on the 1st of July, so that's when the website is open for students. So that's where you can access um, all of our... Um, materials um, such as the webinar delivery. So we do hold them uh, on regular, so we usually put them on a Tuesday at midday. Obviously students can't always come at the same time, so um, for students that can't come when they are delivered, we do record them and embed them on that website as well. Um, around the end of October, you'll have your internal judging round here at QUT. Um, the semi-finalists, Judging round for undergraduate students will be on the 13th of November, with the finals being held in Melbourne on the 28th of November um, at PricewaterhouseCooper again. All right. So, which social issue, which social issue should you choose? If you choose Big Idea Challenge A, it will go with the social issue proposed by the organisation you're hoping to support. Um, B a social issue that's close to you either because of personal con connection, geographic proximity, or because you have a particular interest. Um, I like to focus on things like that you have a personal connection with. So it doesn't um, 
have to be located in Australia. Some of you may um, be international students. If you have an issue back in your home country that you want to address, um, this is a great idea and avenue to do so. So one of our, our post-grad winners from last year from University of New South Wales were all international students from Indonesia. Now, if you're from Indonesia, you know how big the wedding, wedding industry is over there, where they use a lot of flowers and there's a lot of flower wastage. So the students created a business where that flower wastage was um, used to create products like um, soaps and candles. And the people that created those products were people with disabilities. Um, because in Indonesia, there aren't very many work opportunities for people that um, have physical di disabilities. Um, one of our past winners as well from in 2017 from Macquarie University um, has indigenous heritage and he saw that his heritage was being lost. So their idea was to create an online library tool in, on a tablet that has indigenous knowledge, indigenous stories, um, um, so things like dream time sto stories, um, talks from elders, drone footage um, of traditional places. And so that tablet, the business model for that was that that tablet and library was sold to high SES schools, which would then in turn pay for low SES schools to have access. So they're actually implementing that library um, and tool in New South Wales schools right now. So it could be something that develops um, into something that you didn't expect. <laughs> I've had students that said, oh, well, I can't, I can't leave my idea now. Um, another winner from 2017 from Monash University from the um, PG cohort was Stephanie Huang. So she was working um, in her spare time. She was volunteering at a local, local community centre with refugee women, saw that refugee women w didn't have access to work for a lot of reasons like the women that work with us because of um, not ha having background education, maybe not um, having to look after their, their kids. So she's been working with Melbourne-based designers and refugee women to create um, jewellery that the women can make either at the community centre or at home and then upload to a website to create their own form of income as well. So she's um, still going on with her idea, which is awesome. All right, to register um, with... The big idea, Steph has got um, of all of the information on those handouts that you see sent before. Um, then head to our website. Um, Steph can obviously give you all of this information later on if you don't um, jot it down today uh, at thebigidea.org.au um, and the student login password is student2019. Um, please do attend the online webinars and workshops or go and have a look at them when they are recorded. They are a great wealth of knowledge um, that um, is a great resource as you're building your idea as well and chat on things like the discussion board that we have going as well. All right, I think I've talked enough. I'm going to ask Ben to come down. Sure. Ben is one of our local vendors here in Brisbane. Thank you. I'm going to hook you up, mate. Here we go. No, no, it's all good. No, it's all good. <laughs> Good morning. Nice to see so many people interested in, in this project. Uh, my name is Ben. I'm just going to give you a bit of background about myself and then we'll take it from there. Um, I grew up in Glasgow in Scotland, um, working class family, left school, joined the police force of all things. Um, didn't like it, didn't like putting people in jail. <laughs> so, I've always been interested in guitar and music, and so I became a musician. And for my entire life, regardless of what I was doing in the background, I was always a musician, first and foremost, guitar. I went to university, got myself a master's degree in sociology, and was considered worthy enough in social circles, at one stage to dine with a royal family. I sat at dinner with the Duke of Edinburgh right opposite me and we had a, a, a wonderful exchange of views 
<laughs> um, actually, I quite like the guy because he was, although he was argumentative, he was forthright, to the point, stuck by his principles, and I did the exact same. Um, it was really good stuff if you were listening in. Now, the music, my career progressed. I started playing in bands that were spotted and picked up, and we supported people like Van Morrison. Um, we were good. We were pretty good. Um, I was enjoying a good life. I had a, a penthouse apartment in Chelsea, of all places, in the Sloan Avenue. Um, life was good. And then personal tragedy struck. Devastating personal tragedy. That involved my 10-year-old daughter. And I suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder from then on. So although I was maintaining my presence and my job and holding everything together, I was deeply troubled at a mental health level. Um, now, that trauma ended up destroying the marriage of my wife and I at the time. And I was single, and I was single for some years. And I decided, I met an Australian woman about 15 years ago, and she convinced me that I could come to Australia, and with my skills, my talent on guitar and what have you, I could kickstart my career again. And, and I, I said, yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good, I'll reinvent myself. So I came to Australia. Within six months of marrying her, coming to Australia, I woke up in bed one day and I said to her, ah, I think I've slept on my arm last night. I've got pins and needles in it. By the end of that evening, my arm was rigid and my fingers were all crooked in like this. And so they rushed me off to hospital and said, you've had a stroke, you've had a stroke. Now, I didn't have a stroke. I have never had a stroke. And nobody could figure out what on earth was wrong with this arm. Now, they tried surgery, they cut it here at the elbow, messed about with the nerves, and no, nothing. Now, I was devastated because I'm a guitarist. It's what I do. I mean, I also sing, but I'm principally a guitarist. I went for years here in Australia with nobody understanding what was wrong with me. I've seen neurologists, I've seen all sorts of people, and nobody could get to the bottom of what was wrong with my arm. My relationship with my wife deteriorated, and that was because of my depression. I mean, I'll be upfront with you there. My fault, another marriage ruined. I ended up on the streets, sleeping in South Bank, because I have no relatives. I have no family in Australia. Eventually, I found a place in a hostel for homeless people and booked in there. But you're living in accommodation that has like 80 people in an open plan. It's horrendous. It's really, I, I couldn't even begin to describe how soul destroying it is. But it's a, it's, it's a roof over your head. Whilst there, I realized that when you pay rent for that, um, from the, the welfare benefit that you get for being unemployed and blah, 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 it, it left me with $45 to get through a week once you've paid your rent. Now, some of you as students might know what that's like. <laughs> it's really tough when you've only got $45 to get, get through. And you've got to do everything with that. Feed yourself, do laundry, all sorts. It's crazy. Um, <coughs> But somebody mentioned the big issue, and this is where the reality of these social enterprises and the ideal collide. Is it really what it purports to be? Well, I can stand here in front of you and say, yeah, it does. I started selling the big issue, um, and at that time, I was in a cast that my arm had to be, or the nerves had to be aerated. So I was in a cast, which meant this arm stuck out like this, and I had a plastic hand cover thing 
which was actually ideal for sticking the big issue in and just standing there and saying, big issue, I mean, I could do that all day long. It was, it was fantastic. But, um, so I did that for a while. And then a woman noticed, my arm maybe couldn't help but notice it, but she came over and she said she was from the ABC. Now, maybe some of you know the ABC studio in South Bank. She said she was a journalist with the ABC and um, she asked me my story. What happened with your arm? Why is it like this every day? And she mentioned on the radio and she mentioned my story and she mentioned that I sold the big issue. And that same day, there were offers came pouring in for all kinds of radical treatment. There was, there was a, a neurosurgeon who wanted to inject me with stem cells. There was all sorts of offers came up. But the one that I decided on was physiotherapy, and it wasn't any ordinary physiotherapy. This was physiotherapy from another planet almost. It was incredible. And they got my arm moving, and they got my hand moving as well. It's nothing like it used to be. On guitar, I can't play bar chords. I, can't, I don't have the strength in my hand. However, thanks to the big issue and standing on the street and selling it, I had that social contact, that point of contact that I would never have had any other way. Um, and the actual selling of the big issue itself, it allowed me to feed myself, clothe myself, because remember, it was $45 a week. If I could double that, it meant that I could buy vital things, like underwear, socks, um, stuff that you really, really need. And another thing for homeless people to bear in mind is that they struggle with many things that we take for granted, like spectacles. Spectacles is a classic example. When you're homeless and living rough, it's easy to fall asleep on them because you've got all your stuff packed in tight beside you and you roll over and you crush your specs and you bend your specs and can't sleep with them on because you'll bend the legs. Um, so spectacles is a, is a big issue. Um, and it's things like that that the hostel, for example, the homeless hostel, uh, they would collect lost spectacles from different organizations like the casino, who's left it. I know after six months, they would get a box full of spectacles and, and us homeless folks would just go through them one after the other. And um, unfortunately for me, the only ones that I could see properly through looked like something Dame Edna Everage would wear. They were like huge, but, but I could see. Now the big issue allowed me to make enough money to actually buy a pair. I could go and get a pair. Not the greatest, but hey, I could do it, you know, and that was all thanks to the, the money that I made through the big issue. At a personal level, how does it feel to be standing there selling the big issue? I mean, that first day I went out and I had my arm like this, and I'm thinking my whole world has collapsed. How on earth did you get from having a penthouse place in Chelsea to standing on a bridge in Brisbane with a big issue in your hand? How did that happen? How, how could you fall so, so far and so hard? One of the things that I discovered when I was doing that was that people in Australia, or maybe it's even just Brisbane, because that's the only experience I have, are very non-judgmental. They will listen to your story, and many of them wanted to know your story. And again, I loved that point of social contact, standing there on the street, selling a big... I loved it when somebody came up and said, so what's up with you, mate? You know, and, and you could get it off your chest, you could let them know, because they pass by you every day, and you wanted them to know, look, I don't do drugs, I don't do booze, I didn't end up in this situation because I gamble or I've got an addiction of some kind. You want to let people know that. Um, and the only opportunity of doing that is when they stop and talk to you. And that's a, a thing that I would encourage people to do with big issue vendors, is if you see one, talk to them. Just talk to them. Um, I'll tell you, tell you what that was like. I have a friend who, for 20 years now, he's been pretty big on the international music scene, and he's an actor, and he's from Brisbane. <laughs> 
<laughs> when, when I'd just got my arm fixed and what have you, I, I play every morning. I play my guitar now when I sell the big issue. I'm the only vendor that's allowed to do it in Australia. But I play my guitar on Victoria Bridge down at the South Bank Cultural Centre. And I do it between 6 o'clock and 9 o'clock every morning, sell the big issue there. And I went for coffee with my friend. And I said to him, George, what are you up to? What are you doing? And he said he was doing some touring show about Queen, um, the band Queen, and that they were playing Wembley Arena uh, in three days' time. So he's flying off to, to London. I said, awesome. He said, what are you doing? I said, ah, yeah, I'm down at the cultural centre there, you know, the, <laughs> the Q-Pack. And he said, oh, are you? I said, yeah, yeah. He says, is it going well? I said, oh, yeah, a couple of thousand people every day. And I wasn't lying because there was a couple of thousand people past me every morning. But the terrible feeling inside that, you know, this is, this is what I've become. This is where I am. And I, I hated that feeling. But I want to tell you something. The big issue has radically altered my life. I get opportunities from standing there, selling a the big issue, playing my guitar, and I'm very, very lucky. I, I get opportunities that other vendors maybe don't get, but I hope and I wish that they could get. Um, I've just recently returned from Hamilton Island. I don't know if any of you are aware of Hamilton Island. I've been up there for three, four days. It's a millionaire's paradise. And it was paid for me by somebody who heard me singing while selling the big issue and said, oh, I want you to sing at my wedding. And the wedding was in Hamilton Island. They paid for everything. I just came back this week. But I also want to tell you something about how my mentality has changed since that first day, standing there and thinking my world has ended. I don't view it like that anymore. I actually see standing there selling the big issue as a symbol, as a sign to everybody that I'm fighting back, that I am not giving up, I am not giving in. And this is proof, evidence of that. The big issue gives you a confidence in some kind of strange way that was lacking from before. It was missing. It's like you're part of something that's bigger than you. And, and I think everybody needs to feel that, that you're part of something that's bigger than you. And you're important. You have a role to play within that. Um, so, yeah, I, I would encourage you to... Think, obviously, about the differences that any enterprise, social enterprise that you might have in your head, the differences they make for the end recipient, the, the person who's going to benefit from, from all of this. How much buy? What does it do? How does it change their lives? And what I've given you today is just an insight into mine. And hopefully you can take something from that and plug it in to whatever idea you have in your head. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Ben at all? Yeah. Um, thanks for coming, Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, was there something that happened that made you uh, willing to go try out the big issue or willing to try and kind of get back up on the horse? Yeah, because it's so bleak when you're sitting in a homeless hostel and, you know, you've got... I'll, I'll be up front with you. It's, you've got some really nice people who are there through circumstances, but you've also got a lot of addicts, violent people, people who have just come out of prison and have got nowhere to go and they go to a homeless hostel. It's a violent, hostile environment. And when you're sitting there and you know you've only got $45 to survive, you're thinking to yourself, this is it. This, there's no way forward from this. There's no way out. I'm stuck here. It's, somebody once said to me in the hostel, hostel that they, meaning authority, set you up to fail. They don't mind you sitting in a hostel the rest of your life because you're no good to them, you're not productive. Um, and so the penny drops that you've got to do something. You can't just sit there. 
And when somebody said to me, have you heard of the big issue? And I hadn't. I said, you know, you get, at that time, it was $3. It was, um, I said, you get $3 every issue that you sell. And, all right, that's interesting. And, and to help you out, when you actually start selling the big issue, they give you your first one free. So let's say you get one and you make $4.50 because somebody's just given you, uh, well, no, actually, you make $9. You can go back and buy two from the office and then sell them and get $18 and go back and get four. Um, and so it goes on and on. Um, and you're limited only by the amount that you can sell. Uh, so, I mean, I remember there's been times when I needed food. And so I would go out and I would stay on the street until I'd sold 10. And then I can go and buy whatever I like. You know, it, it's, it's that flexible. It's that, um, I wouldn't say it's easy to do because you're, you're counting on people being generous. But, yeah, the idea that you're stuck in a, a cycle of decline that you're never going to get out of unless you take action. That, that, that's what motivated me to get up off my backside and um, do what I needed to do, sell the big issue until I had enough for a, a bond, for a, a, a room and, and what have you. That's the way it's been ever since. Ben, is there a difference between being like given money, say, say if you had just been given that $45 as opposed to earning it? Yeah, um, I, one, being given $45, although it's very nice, um, there's that feeling that, well, I don't really deserve this, I did nothing for it, and you cannot rely on it. You cannot say, if I stand in the same place next Monday, somebody's going to hand me $45. There is a kind of, especially after maybe, say, six weeks selling the big issue, you start to understand how many you're going to sell in that particular spot, when, what days. So, I mean, I know that I sell maybe 20, 30 issues a week on, it's always somewhere in between there, on Victoria Bridge. Um, and that never fluctuates. It's always somewhere in 20, 30 um, so I know I've got that income. I can count on it. I've worked for it. That's mine. And I can go somewhere else and, and find out, you know, a different time, maybe later in the afternoon, try the Goodwill Bridge, I think it's called, or, or one of the other bridges, stand there and play my guitar, sell the big issue. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, you, can, you can count on it. You know it's your income. Yeah. Um, one thing, obviously, as well, and we like to promote is empowering people through work. So, um, and a story I like to tell, and I was telling last year because I, we employ, I employed a new woman in our classroom program. So we obviously employ someone who's experienced homelessness to tell their personal story. So we recruited someone through our uh, community street soccer program, a lady who'd experienced homelessness, um, and she's been working in our program almost a year now. But I remember the first, um, uh, she'd been there about two weeks and she came in just looking like she was really happy and looked really good and like that typical thing of when a woman like has something new on and you feel good. And I noticed this jumper that she had never seen her in before. I said, oh, Debbie, you look really nice. It's a nice jumper. You look really good. And she goes, yeah, I bought it with my first paycheck. I did that. It wasn't someone gave me money so then I could buy it. I earned the money and then I bought it for myself. I, don't, I doubt she would have that same look on her face if someone just gave her the shirt, the, the jumper, or if they just gave her the money. She feels empowered that she's going out there, working, and then is able to support herself in that simple little way. Um, and that's why we, um, we focus on helping people help themselves. We don't give people money. We don't just give them stuff. We give them the opportunity to do that for themselves. So that has a lot of flow-on effects. So that's another thing to focus on if you're wanting to continue and thinking about your idea. It's not just handing something out. It's giving the opportunity to then work, um, which we find is really, really important. So things like... We've had um, people that have come and started to work and then they've, because they've started to feel empowered, then go on and um, uh, start for, do further study. 
learn how to read. Um, go and get a TAFE, do, do a TAFE course um, because that has flow on effects from that empowerment. Does anyone have any questions? At all? It's all very, very quiet. <laughs> really? Um, you can come and talk to me. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry? Next, yep. that's so what Steph's going to talk about. Yes. <laughs> um, so the next stage is, is if you haven't already registered for the actual competition, um, there's a link on there to um, the RPUT page where um, it has a sign-up form and everything. So um, once you've actually signed up, I'll start um, sending emails probably later in May um, to get everyone prepared. The competition runs through semester two. So um, it won't be actually starting um, until the July. So um, yeah, you will see more. If you've registered, you'll get the updates from me on what's happening and everything. So I'll keep everyone really updated. And students can work in singly or in groups up to six people. Um, Steph, yeah, can you help with? So, um, the registration page has the option you can register as an individual as a team. If you already have a team, that's when you select the team option. So if you've got a group of friends that you want to work with, you don't have to be from the same course or anything like that. Um, so you can work with anyone else who's enrolled at QUT. Um, we're only in the undergraduate section of the competition, so unfortunately we can't have postgraduate people. But um, anyone who's in an undergraduate course at QUT can be in your team. So, um, yeah, just go on and register and um, select team. If, you put, if you've got a team, it asks you to enter the names. That's just so I can know who's in which team. But you can work for, on your own if you like. Um, but otherwise, I will allocate teams. So that will happen in June. Um, and I'll let everybody know. Um, well, then, Still if registered. we're not registered no. in there, yeah. So only under undergrads for QUT. Oh, no. I did have it in the thing, but they may not That's have. Right. Sorry about that. Yeah? You can, yeah. So you can, um, some people have emailed me that already have an idea that they've been interested in um, making this gives them an opportunity to develop the idea more. Um, so yeah, totally fine to work on your own and submit your own entry. And I'll send more detailed timelines around to everyone who's registered, just to let you know exactly when um, things will be happening. It is really good to have uh, students from, if you've got a team of students from different backgrounds and different cohorts. Um, because they come in with different skill sets as well. So just like when you eventually go out into the workforce, you have to work with you know, your accounting team, your marketing team. Um, it's a really good opportunity to then get different um, skill sets to work on one idea. It's just something I would encourage. Awesome. All right. Okay, Did guys. anyone not get a handout? There's some more at the back there just on the way out. You can grab one. Got all the links on there, so just you email yeah. me if you have any problems. If you have any questions or you want to have a chat, come down and um, yeah, come and speak with us. So